Everybody, put your hands together. Mr. John Russo. It's a slow day. <laughs> yeah. So did you want to talk about, um, well, actually, my question for you is for Night of the Living Dead, what inspired you to make it about zombies instead of some other, you well, know? We, <laughs> can you hear me without it? Uh, we didn't start out to make a zombie movie. <laughs> we, uh, we wanted to, uh, well, first of all, I met George Romero when I was 18 years old. We, so was he. George came to Pittsburgh to go to Carnegie Tech, which is an album of Carnegie Mellon, and he was a fine arts major. I was at West Virginia University, and my friend Rudy Ritchie, who we came from, graduated from high school together, both wanted to be writers, but he enrolled at Carnegie Tech as a fine arts major. And the first day on campus, he and George are both together in line because both their names start with R, you know, and they're wearing their, their uh, freshman beanies, looking at each other, thinking they look silly. And uh, Rudy called me up and he said, when you come back for Christmas vacation, you, you have to meet this great guy, George Romero. He said, he said when we're in uh, the, life, the life model class, you know, it's supposed to be drawing a nude model, and instead of drawing the nude, George is drawing scenes from Ben-Hur. So, <laughs> great. <laughs> so, I always look for the zany, creative kind of people to befriend, you know. And so, I came back uh, for Christmas vacation, and, and we w drove to, to George's apartment in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, and... Uh, Rudy honked a horn, and Rudy, George came down to the sidewalk, and he was wearing a big sombrero and black droopy mustachios and bandoleros of ammunition and two pistolas. <laughs> and we didn't, you know, we're so cool, we didn't react to that. We, he just got in the car, and we went to get ice cream. And they got out of the car, went up to the uh, window, and the girl slammed the window shut and wouldn't wait on us. She was too scared, so we just laughed, and, you know, Rudy, Rudy said, you should have seen George last week. He was covered head to toe in tinfoil. <laughs> that was like Man from, I don't know, one of those science fiction movies of the 50s, and had a metallic-looking alien in it, and so George, the, the reason he was wearing the sombrero and all that was because one of his favorite movies was Viva Zapata with Marlon Brando. So he would, I guess he did cosplay before there was cosplay, you know, <laughs> all by himself. <laughs> so, and then the same Christmas vacation, uh, Rudy and I went to uh, see a play that Russ Streiner was in. I always forget the name of the play. He had one line in it, some he's a soldier and being standing in line with all these troops and the general asks him a question about some woman and he, well she's a whore sir <laughs> that was his line and everybody laughs you know back in those days so uh, so that so George and Russ and I uh, uh, met the same very same weekend and been friends ever since and of course, George passed away in the two seven, 2017, and uh, I spoke at his funeral, and um, there were about 20 people spoke at his funeral, but I got a standing ovation, and everybody thought that what I had to say was the best, you know, and they used lines from it. When George got his star on the Walk of Fame, they had a full-page ad in Variety, and they quoted what I said about him, and what the, it was actually the end. I was talking about uh, one, it, basically here's what I said, that George and I were walking down, walking in New York one day, and talking about Sammy Davis and Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, how much we admired their style and their music and so on, and I said the world is a poorer place without them. And I said, um, 
and George Romero made his mark on the world in the world as a poorer place without George Romero, and we'll, now we'll have to cherish our memories. And they quoted that, they put that on that ad, which I didn't know they were going to do that, but there it was. So <clears throat> anyway, but your question was, <laughs> so we all want, <laughs> eventually, George was the one initially that was nuts about making movies and had some experience at it because his father was a commercial artist and uh, he did posters and standees and banners for the movies, you know, in his, in, he worked for an art studio in New York. So, and George had worked, done some minor bit of, like a grip or a, or a production assistant or something on a couple movies and he exaggerated his credentials and we bought into it. <laughs> And so, about the time I was going into the Army, Russ and George started a company. It's such a long story, I don't know how much to cut out here, but eventually, uh, when I got out of the Army, I, I came to work with them, and, and we wanted to be feature filmmakers, but we built up our credentials by doing TV commercials and industrials and every kind of movie, hundreds of movies, and we had walls covered with our awards for our work. And so George and I were having lunch one day with Richard Ritchie, who was Rudy's cousin, and we had, George had gotten him a job with an ad agency as a producer for TV spots. And, uh, but a lot of the companies would hire us when they wanted a good job and didn't have much money to spend, but as soon as they got money, they'd run away to New York or Hollywood and hobnob with the stars or the, see the Broadway plays or whatever. So we were bitching about it, drinking beer and eating grilled provolone sandwiches in a restaurant around the corner from our studio. And Richard said, well, instead of bitching about it, why don't you do something about it? So I thought for a few minutes, and we had just bought this big a 35 millimeter camera that was not a self blimped camera. It was in a, and you know, to, to, to seal the sound of the camera, the camera has to be blimped. But modern cameras are very small and mobile and they accomplish that purpose. But, but the older cameras had, had, the sound had to be, of the gears of the camera had to be sealed inside this, 80 pound monstrosity that you had to lug around on the tripods had to be, you know. Anyway, we bought this thing for 3,500 bucks and I said, you know, what if we had 10 of us that chipped in 600 bucks each and that would give us $6,000 and maybe we could shoot 35 millimeter and work print it down to 16 because all of our editing and mixing and all our gear was in 16. And then once it's done, once the film's done, then you, you, you match it up to the 35, you know. I said, we, we should be able to make something better than these El Cheapo Mexican films that you see on late night children theater. And George got all excited. Like any time there was a prospect of making any kind of film, George would get all psyched up. And man, we're going to make a movie, and all the bottles and ashtrays went flying, and the patrons were staring at us, and Richard Richard had this very serious way about him. He would, when he smoked cigarettes, you know, he always looked way more serious than the situation merited, and that was just his style, and he would blow smoke rings and make these esoteric comments. So he blows a series of smoke rings and he says, you guys are crazy. I said, well, you want in or you want out? He blew another chorus of smoke rings. He said, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you, last time I saw George, I made him laugh like hell. And then he told me about the cancer, but at least I made him laugh. I'll tell you why. Well, I might as well tell it now and jump ahead. Um, we were in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Mad Monster Convention, and it was 2017, March, March of 2017. 
and Richard had his table next to mine, you know, so we're talking about the old days. In Night of the Living Dead, we had to show that the zombies could only be killed if, if the brain was destroyed. So Richard was the zombie when they're, when they're fighting, when the pane pa pa of glass is shattered and they're trying to grab that rifle and, from Ben and everything. Richard gets shot in the chest and he goes down. I think he gets shot twice and goes down, but he gets back up both times until he's shot in the head. Then he goes down, okay? In the remake, in 1990, we got hit with all kinds of residual rainstorms from the hurricanes in Florida and moving up the coast and dumping rain and, you know, terrible storms all over everything. And we were trying to, uh, in the last days of shooting, trying to dress up the ending of the movie and make it as exciting as we could. And so George and I would be were standing there, you know, and I'd say, Hey, George, we ought to have a zombie that has a hospital gown on and an IV hanging out of his arm. Go see if the F, go see if the special effects guys can whip that up. And I'd go and they'd say, yeah, we can do that. And then they'd do it and then we'd shoot that, you know. And I, I said, you know, in the, in, in, the, in the original movie, Marilyn Eastman, maybe some of you don't know this, she was in a different makeup as a ghoul and she's the one that eats the insect off the tree. Okay, so I said, you know, Marilyn ate, an, ate, a, ate an insect off a tree, and why don't somebody maybe should, just one of them ought to eat a mouse. <laughs> Go see if they can make a mouse. <laughs> yeah, we can make a mouse. So Richard and I are talking about this. <clears throat> like, a, Richard was very spacey and weird, you know. We were all friends and, you know, just zany, creative people. And so we're talking about that, and Richard, Richard said, uh, it was really strange to have that little furry thing in my mouth. I said, you ought to be glad we didn't cram a gerbil up your ass. <laughs> so, so everybody knows Richard, and you know, I'm not saying whether he's gay. Or, I actually don't know if he was gay or not. So it had nothing to do with that. It was just the, the one-liner, you know, and everybody's laughing. I said, I'm going to go. George would always see, like, when he moved to Toronto, we didn't see each other as often. But when he would see me, he'd say, I'm noted for being the one that makes people laugh when we're on stage and stuff, or anywhere. And George would always say, Jack, 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 tell me something funny. Tell me a joke. And I'd tell him whatever the latest funny thing. So I said, I'm going to go see if George doesn't have a big line in front of him right now. And if he doesn't, I'm going to tell him this. <laughs> so he didn't have a big line, and I sat down with him behind his table, and I told him, and he laughed like hell. And then he told me, it's especially funny if you know Richard, then he told me they found things in my lungs, and I have to have a CAT scan and a biopsy, and he was very frail even then, you know. So we knew we knew right then that, that it wouldn't be good, and of course he 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 died in in July of that year. So uh, <laughs> that's the end of that story. What uh, what else, Miles? I was still wondering why you guys decided on zombies. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're taking a very problem. long. See, I told everything <laughs> except that. It's a very long journey to get there. Well, like I said, we, we were already thinking about a horror film because we watched some of these, the, the TV station, it was Bill Cardill's program, and they would buy a whole slate of very inexpensive movies made in Mexico, and some of them, like, you could see two before us hanging out of the monster. You know, they were that bad. And we'd get drunk or just sit there drinking wine or smoking marijuana and watch these things and laugh, you know. So I figured we could make something better than that. And then we got sidetracked a couple. Rudy Ritchie came up with an idea of something about, like, space. This was almost E.T. before there was E.T., and we worked out this whole plot about 
space uh, aliens that are t like teenagers from space somewhere and they come to Earth and they befriend the Earth kids and now the Earth kids are playing all these jokes on the people in the town and the dumbass sheriff is trying to catch them and figure out what's going on. And, uh, and so uh, we, and it was pretty good too. And George and I went out with the camera one day. The big thing was how in the hell could we on no budget show like this spacecraft landing on Earth and all that. So George and I went out, and it was real cold. I think it was in December. And uh, we're trying to photograph parts of water towers or anything we can think of or spot that, that might look extraterrestrial. And the only thing that came out of it was that the camera froze and George left a $150 light meter hanging on a fence up in Mount, Mount Washington, so we lost a light meter and the camera froze. So I started working on a thing about, um, and, and I figured, well, we can't show a landing, but what if they're already here? extraterrestrials okay so I wrote I started right and I said to George whatever we do should start in a cemetery because people find cemetery spooky even if it's Abbott and Costello meet Dracula and they're in the cemetery and the candles are moving all over the coffin and all that you know so I started with uh, some kids in a in a cemetery one of them wearing a ghoul mask it's Halloween and they've stolen a case of beer and they're looking for a place to hide it and they get caught. And the one kid gets grounded by his parents and he runs away from home and he's going through the woods with his belongings and crack, he steps through a pane of glass in the ground. And under that pane of glass is a rotting corpse. And there are more rotting corpses. And that's the thing behind it was, which I, I told George, when we were beating ideas around, I said, I'm thinking that these aliens are here and they're killing people and, the, and they're eating their flesh, and, but they like to have them a little rotten. Like in medieval times when in Eng old England, you know, they would shoot a goose. They would hang the goose up to rot for a few days before they ate it. Now, why now the they did that? I don't know, but that's what they did. So, me, a couple weeks later, George went away. For, he, was, he didn't come into the studio for a weekend or something. And he came in, he had 20 or 30 pages of a story that started in the cemetery. And then it's a girl and her brother, and the brother gets attacked, and the girl runs from somebody, and they're running. And it was... It was almost like the beginning of Night of the Living Dead, except, and I said to Georgia, well, you know, this stuff, is, this is good. I said, it's got all the right suspense and twists and turns, but who's chasing this girl? You don't say. And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, it seemed to me they could be dead people. He said, that's good. I said, well, what are they after? They don't claw, they don't bite, you know, what, what are they, why are they chasing? I don't know, he said. I said, why don't we use my flesh-eating idea? So, so that pretty much answers your question. That's how they became dead people after human flesh. So after that, George got tied up in some job or other, and I, we had some script meetings, and, and then I took all that. And most of the ideas in the script meeting were mine, to tell you the truth. Everybody was kind of... I was surprised George didn't have any further ideas, which I later, later he told Richard Matheson on some TV program, he apologized for ripping off I Am Legend. I had never read I Am Legend. <laughs> Matheson said, well, I guess it's okay if you didn't make much money. Well, we didn't make much money. The movie made tons of money, but we got cheated out of most of it. So anyway, so that's why I guess he, you know, he, that, he didn't have many ideas after that. He did a great job directing a movie, 
but I took I took whatever ideas were there and I wrote this I rewrote what he wrote and then I wrote the whole rest of it in three weeks you know and then uh, when I got the script done we Rudy Ritchie was married by then and lived a few minutes from Pittsburgh, and we went to his place to grill steaks and drink wine and read the script. They were going to read it. So George read it, and he said, there's something wrong with it. Here, Rudy, you read it. So he gives it to Rudy. Rudy reads it said, there's nothing wrong with it. And George thought for a few minutes, and he said, well, he said, I know what's the matter. He said, we need another siege. And by that, he meant there needs to be a moment where the ghouls almost overrun the house but don't succeed and then finally they overrun the house so we didn't write it we just did it you know and there were things we changed during filming my first the ending that I wrote the girl survives somebody and this wasn't me somebody said well maybe the brother should come back after her and we really consider that extensively because, you know, the, the brother's head's supposed to be bashed and he's supposed to be dead, but then we're thinking, well, well, maybe, okay, maybe his brain was partially destroyed and he could still come back. We didn't want to blow it, you know. We didn't want to uh, make people stop believing in what we were doing, and, and, and we, we decided that the audience would buy it. And, and so we, we, we shot it that way. The, end, the other end, and I have, by the way, I, here's a shameless uh, plug. <laughs> I have the original screenplays for sale at my table. But um, in, in the, the original ending that I wrote, the, uh, uh, Ben makes it to the basement and does everything that he does. And, but he... But he and the girl both, Barbara, both make it to the basement. And Ben comes back up and he gets killed by accident. And the sheriff and the deputy then work their way through the ruins of the house and down into the basement. And they almost shoot Barbara till one of them sees a tear roll down her face. They don't shoot her. And the last thing you see is... Uh, She's huddled in that trench coat, and the sheriff's trying to get her to take some coffee or something. And you see Ben's body being carried out to the bonfire in the background. Not a bad ending, but, you know, we didn't do it that way. We have a question over here. Um, did you get to play a part in the movie? of Night? Uh, I, can't, I can't hear. Did you get to play a part in Night of the Living Dead? Did I play a part? Yeah. I was the, I did quite a few, we all did everything that it took, you know. <laughs> and uh, there were only about six of us in our company. Now, on the remake, we had 110 people. And uh, anyway, I, I, I played the ghoul that got the tire in the head. I fight with Ben. I also did the Molotov cocktail stunt. You know, I... I said to George, you know, we're, we're going to shoot this Molotov cocktail thing tonight, and if we made a point that they're just dead flesh and they go up pretty easy, and if none of them catches on fire, we're going to look stupid. He said, well, we don't have a stunt man. We don't have an asbestos suit. I said, oh, hell, I'll do it. So I just put on tight Levi's and pulled a rumpled brown suit that was too big, and put that on over the Levi's and George and I set the camera up and you know I got in a position Carl Hardman made a puddle of gasoline around my feet and up my, up my leg and back and on action he would throw a match into the puddle the flames would come up my back and I would stagger like a zombie till I felt my hair being singed and then I would roll over this hill fall over this hill where people were waiting with blankets to smother the flames. And we did three takes and they're all in the movie. I was also the general's driver in the Washington DC scene uh, in my army uniform. And 
A lot of times, George and I would go with the camera when nobody was around and do pickup shots, you know, just environmental shots. Or There was nobody almost on top of Ben when he makes it back into the house after the failed escape attempt. So those are just my hands reaching from the side of the camera. And we always did that. You know, we'd do beer commercials. I must have done 10,000 beer pours. I got expert at it, you know. I would... <laughs> you, can't, you can't have fish eyes. You know what fish eyes are? If there are impurities in the glass, they'll cling to the glass and they look like fish eyes up close especially. So you have to... You have to, um, and you and you have to get the right amount of head on the beer and to the top of the glass, but not flowing over. So all of that, I mean, we did so much stuff. By the time we got made Night of the Living Dead, we were a really tight knit, tight knit production unit, and nobody needed to be told what to do. We all knew, you know, every film, whether it's a lowly TV commercial, whatever it. Is, Every film needs to be cast, it needs to be costumed, sets, locations, props, scoring, every film, whether it's a 60-second TV commercial or whatever it is. So by that time, we had done hundreds of every kind of film. We knew what needed to be done, you know. And so that's, that's to a large extent why Night of the Living Dead was successful and why it looks as polished as it does for no money. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Here we go. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the original... I think you have to hold that close. Oh, sorry, is this better? A little too much? <laughs> uh, I just want to say that uh, I really fell in love with your movie over... Uh, you it being free on YouTube. I, I can't I hear. Can you hear it? I'm sorry. Maybe you can relay it. So he fell in love with I your have movie. A bit it was of high on the hearing loss, but it's only a little bit. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. So he fell in love with your movie. It was uh, free on YouTube. Yes. What? Your movie was free on YouTube, and he fell in love with Night of the Living Dead. And I know that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't meant to be free. I still didn't catch the whole thing. Okay, so. Yeah, I'll ask the whole question, then I'll relay it. I was just going to say, I, I know people uh, uh, have a lot of political uh, interpretations about the movie, and I know that, <laughs> and no, I know that was never like no, we any of your intentions uh, in that, especially... Well, that all got started. There was a British guy who wrote for a magazine called Sight and Sound, I think it was 1969, and he talked about all these political ramifications, and he even said you could hear strains of Old Black Joe on the soundtrack. <laughs> False. No, the sheriff's not even a redneck. He's just a guy doing a job. Ben gets killed by accident. He would have been shot whether he was white or black or what. I the other you know, I, I said, when I came into the studio one day, and I, I was writing the script, and I said, I think, you know, somebody... Pennsylvania is a big deer hunting state, and every year, three or four hundred thousand deer are shot or, or slaughtered, and ten or twelve drunk hunters. <laughs> and so, somebody would be killed by accident if all these people running around with guns. And wouldn't it be ironic if it was our hero Ben? So that's what we did. I know a lot of people say that um, it was, you know, ahead of its time casting a black guy uh, a black man as the lead role in the movie, especially well, in the 1960s. Well, that's true, and we're, you know, that's how we were always tried to, poor as we were at the time, we still tried to give breaks to people that deserved it, and usually people that didn't get a break. You know, we would throw the studio open so jazz musicians could jam and rehearse and things like that. And, uh, and so... There was no hesitation. Dwayne just came in, and he was the best actor. Rudy Ritchie was going to play that part, and and uh, even Rudy voted for Dwayne. So, what can I say? His uh, 
we were good friends till he died. We became friends during the making of the movie. And he thought that he had a fear of being exploited. And uh, the big catharsis came when he had to, he had to do his big speech tearing down, tearing down the table and saying, trying to make that incident at Beekman's Diner come alive because we weren't going to film it. You know, we couldn't afford to blow up gas pumps and trucks and everything. So that speech had to work. And Dwayne just broke down in tears when he got through it and went around and hugged us all because that was the height of his realizing we weren't there to exploit him or anybody else, just here there rooting for him and rooting for each other and trying to make a good movie. So, uh, and he was very intellectual. He taught at Columbia University. His, um, they were from Duane, uh, Duquesne, Pennsylvania, right across the river from Pittsburgh. And Duane's sister was a Harvard Law School graduate, and she, at the time of the bom uh, bombings at the Olympics in Atlanta, she was a, she was a city solicitor. So they were all very intelligent, accomplished people, and you know, that's the way it was. I can't hear it all, but maybe you can. He said it was very impressed, you know, with the movie, you know, Thanks. especially being made a few years yeah. before he's born, decades before he's born. Any other questions? <clears throat> Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> you know you have another one. <laughs> it's fine. You're allowed. <laughs> um, trying to bring it up. <laughs> oh, what was one of your favorite scenes from Night of the Living Dead? <sighs> I don't know if I have a favorite, uh, but what, the thing that cra cracked me up uh, during during filming is uh, I come out the four. There were four of us that stayed at the house because we couldn't afford to have security there. So George and and Gary and uh, and Vince Ravinsky and I stayed at the house. There was no running water. We used to have to carry barrels of water about 200 yards from way down over a hill. And, you know, we took, we used to heat water up on the electric stove to, to kind of do cat baths, you know. And one day I walk out on the porch about five or six in the morning and Vince Ravinsky's out there. He's on the porch and he has this uh, galvanized tub full of water and he's got a Coke bottle and he's holding up these stringy looking things and he's taking water into the coke bottle and pouring it down into these stringy things and tying them in knots i said what the hell are you doing vince it looked like a scene from a fellini movie bizarre kind of thing you know he, ah, he said these are sheep's intestines from a slaughterhouse and one of our investors brought them out, and George said they don't look lifelike enough unless I film with water and time and knots, so they flop around when the zombies grab at them. <laughs> That's how Vince talked, just like that. But uh, he was he was a World War II veteran. He was like some years older than us, you know. And one. Just a great guy. He would do anything. He repaired the bridge so people could get there. The fireplace had no hearth. He made a hearth. I said, we needed a door cut in the, one of the walls because the farmhouse had no basement. So the basement was our studio, the basement in our building, you know. So, but we had to show the, the door that they could get down there. So he cut the door in and did that. And, uh, <laughs> whatever he asked him to do, and he never wanted any accolades, you know. One time we had 
we rented the, we took over the downstairs studio and we had to soundproof it. We couldn't afford soundproofing, so we used um, insulation like, like you would have in an attic, you know, and it's all fiberglass. Oh man, does it play havoc. So Vince and Gary were stapling up, up uh, fiberglass all over the studio. <laughs> And Vince comes up, Vince cut his finger, shot a staple into his finger and it's bleeding and he comes up to the bed and he almost passed out. It was all he could do not to faint and he said, oh hell, he says, he was a like a in, in the artillery in the second world. He said, I went all the way through the war and I saw bodies cut in half and I saw heads blown off, I saw all that. And he said, and then I'm on a ship on the way home, and I cut myself shaving, and I fainted. <laughs> you know, when I took my army physical, there was about 50 guys all passed out all over. When you got into the room where they take blood, I didn't, I didn't know there were so many people that reacted that way to blood. I was even talking to this kid that I went to high school with, and I'm, I'm like talking about old times or something, the next thing I know, he got bleary-eyed and fell onto the floor. And they would, they had people on desks and every, every place, on the floor, every, you know, you just wouldn't imagine that many people that sensitive to it. But. So I have a question. What can you tell us, um, the movie Midnight that you wrote and you wrote the novel, did the novel come first and then you adapted a screenplay from no, that? No, I wrote the screenplay first. I just wanted to do a serial killer type movie, but I had seen, uh, I had seen, uh, I don't think I saw Texas Chainsaw until later, uh, but I saw the, a movie called The Town That Dreaded Sundown and so on. But I wanted it to be more structured and to have a point. You know, Midnight is like, a microcosm of the battle between good and evil, you know, and a, a question, are religion and superstition just different sides of the same coin? I don't believe in any of it myself, frankly. I think it's all horseshit. <laughs> I told this one girl at a, at a, at a reunion in a picnic, she said, asked me about that. I said, well, I don't really believe in the supernatural. And she says, you're a fraud. <laughs> Or do you think James Barry believed in Wonderland? Do you think Anthony Hopkins eats people's livers? It's just, it's fun to play with whether you believe in it or not, but, to, you know, I use it as a vehicle to, you know, in Midnight, nobody wins. Nobody's, nobody's supernatural beliefs are pan, pan out. The girl dies. The witches are not witch. They believe all that shit, but they're <laughs> they're just as wrong as she is, you know. And that's what's going on now. I mean, what do people do? Kill each other over their stupid beliefs, and that's what's happening, you know. And the question: uh, Well, are we going to rise above our differences and so-called differences and and succeed, or is the human race going to destroy itself? I, we got a pretty good leg up on destroying ourselves. So that's the thing about Midnight. The movie, the f first cut, she dies. She's in the cage praying just like in the novel. And, uh, and you know she's going to die. But Sam Sherman, my friend, and he was the distributor on it. And Sam said, we'll never get a R rating if the girl dies. So can you write a different ending? So I did. And the ending works, you know, but, uh, <clears throat> uh, how do you prefer to write dialogue in movies? Because I feel like anytime someone's writing dialogue, they feel like they're writing something that's too corny or people aren't going to believe what the character's saying. I just try to make it true to the characters and it takes a lot of work. And I don't always succeed, you know. It's uh, I basically I I generally uh, it, it really helps to uh, have a read through with all the actors and let them put a lot of things in their own words. Especially, you know, I don't keep up with all. The, there's a lot of teenagers in my movies too, or 
people that I don't keep up with all their jargon, impossible. So, some and even with uh, Night of the Living Dead remake, we had a we did have a, a, a reading with all the actors all the way through the script before we at one point before we shot anything, and it, and it, and it helps a lot. Lawrence Tierney, uh, he was, you know, played the stepfather in Midnight. I learned from him, like I've done some acting too, and, and uh, he would get the gist of it down. He wouldn't totally memorize the lines. And, when, and so when they came out with all the, maybe the little flaws or whatever, it was more believable, so... I did a movie called My Uncle John is a Zombie where I play the lead role and I knew so much about the whole zombie lore and what the character should be and what his attitude was that I didn't, you know, I didn't memorize all the lines and I did it the way Tierney did it, you know. There's, um, <laughs> I don't know how many of you, have any of you seen My Uncle John is a Zombie? It's it's really good. <laughs> it gets good reviews all over the place. But uh, Uncle John, he he he's been kept alive by his ditzy niece and his dumbass security guard nephew, and they've kept him alive for forty years, feeding him what he needs, and he gets his speech faculty back like people do when they have a stroke, you know. So now he can talk just like I'm talking now. And people, some people don't believe he's a real zombie. Some people do. He gets examined by the Zombie Research Institute, and they prove that he's really a zombie. And he gets so famous, he gets hired to do commercials. He does one for Cold Crip Pilsner, his favorite beer for, funeral, for funerals and wakes and zombie walks and... Well, my favorite is, and I, <laughs> he does uh, zombie lube. It's an amazing new sexual aid. It'll give a stiff a stiffy. So imagine what it'll do for you. And we have the zombie lube. You know, we, we have everything. We have the novel, we have the movie, we have the soundtrack, and, and we have zombie lube. It, it, it doesn't do anything. It's... <laughs> it's <laughs> So it's just fun doing it, you know. We, we got one person, one curious person, two curious people. I like 20 to think curious, I'm curious people, but letting other people They're all out. shy. That's the way I was in class all the time. You know, I, went, I wasn't one of these trying to, you know, uh, 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 Brown knows the, the teacher or the professor, and are you, you calling so me I'd a brown just be noser? Quiet. <laughs> I'd just be quiet, but then I'd get better grades than they did. But I would know everything that was going on. Some of them were such dumbasses. And uh, this one professor, I took a course in Elizabethan literature, and uh, the the instructor was in his opening comments was talking about all the you know the way that indulgences were sold and how there were so many saints bones in so many churches that you could have i mean there couldn't have been that many saints <laughs> and how and there there were enough pieces of the original cross to to fill a lumber yard and he no sooner gets done with this introduction, satirizing and commenting on the superstition that caused people to do all this. And this one kid raises his hand, says, I have a piece of the original cross. And then he starts describing. And his, his, his name was Professor Watkins. And he, he was a basketball star in college, and his nickname was Red. So Red Watkins, when, when he would get questions like that, he already knew he and I were on the same page. So he'd call on me to answer. <laughs> I'd be the one to put down the person that asked a stupid question. And I was young enough and callow enough to do it, you know. 
Oh, well, whatever. Go ahead. So, what is one of your favorite works? Favorite what? Works, like screen movies, whatever you... Books? Favorite books, is that what you said? Anything that you've done. Anything I've done? Yeah, the books, movies, whatever. I... One of my favorites is the Uncle John movie because, you know, I used to sing in an R&B group in high school and college, and then I got away from that when I started making movies. But I never, you know, I'm, 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 music has been a big deal to me, and I, along with playing the lead role, and co- I hadn't had a co I needed a co-director because I was on camera a lot. And Rob Lucas did a great job. And, but I wrote three of the songs, and I sing two of them as a zombie. And, and I'm getting good reviews for the singing and the acting and everything, so what a kick, you know, to be able to do that at this stage in my career. So, but I, I just, I do so much stuff. You know, everything's your favorite when you're working on it, in a sense. Uh, the, one of the best books I've written is... Uh, the Awakening, which is a very unique uh, uh, vampire novel, and it's about a guy who gets hanged and gets accused of witchcraft and sorcery in 1776, and uh, he he gets they hang him and they bury him in a crossroads with a stake in his heart and manacles. Two hundred years later, the Stake rots away, the manacles rust away, and the flesh grows back. All their mumbo-jumbo works backwards, and he comes back to life 200 years later, and he does have a blood craving now. And he, do- and he doesn't want to kill innocent people, so he decides to go after... Them. When he sees... You, see, you believe that one of the reasons he's being... Uh, uh, executed is because he's a Tory and the other people in the town are, are revolutionists. And so when he comes back in modern Pittsburgh 200 years later and he sees the shit that we're into, he believes he was right that we never should have seceded from Great Britain. And he, and he, and he sets about, you know, so partly as you're saying, it's social commentary through the eyes of a reborn vampire, you know. So that's the kind of stuff I like to play with. But as far as other, I mean, really, I watch a lot of MSNBC. I can't stand what Trump and his ilk are doing to this country. Um, I write a lot about that. Uh, one of the, my favorite things ever is the HBO series Rome. It's just masterful. And uh, and it's all all different writers and directors, but it has a unity to it. You feel like you actually are in Rome, ancient Rome, and it's uh, 35 hours. And I watched all 35 hours five times, and I bought both seasons. And I never do that. I almost never watch anything twice. Been there, done that, you know. So. In the, in, I like the Scorsese's things, almost all of it. Um, pulp Fiction. I, I, um, I'll, watch, I'll watch some of, uh, of Goodfellas almost any, or Casino anytime they're on. You know, I'll watch at least parts of it. They're just so well done. And uh, I like Pulp Fiction a lot, Reservoir Dogs. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, when I finally met Toby Hooper, I could see the talent there, you know. And uh, Toby and I were friends till he died. <laughs> Funny thing. Uh, George Romero had to cancel out of a convention some years ago, and Toby, they flew Toby in to uh, take George's place in... in uh, and it was Toby's birthday, so we about eight of us went and had a birthday dinner for Toby. And I always admired what Caroline Williams did. She stood up and said, you know, if 
here's to Toby because if it wasn't for Toby, I wouldn't have my career. And if I didn't have my career, I wouldn't have my husband. And if I didn't have my husband, I wouldn't have my children. And I thought that was just great because a lot of people don't ever give any credit to anybody. You know, they did it all on their own just like Trump did. <laughs> I can't resist putting a little shiv in that son of a bitch. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, so a couple weeks ago, we were at a, uh, Caroline was, and I were at the same convention. And I said, told her, I said, you know, I always appreciated what you said at Toby's birthday dinner and, uh, and the, about, you know, you wouldn't have your husband and so on if it wasn't blah, blah. And she said, well, the husband's gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when, when people are going to get married, I, I'll, here's what I tell them. You know, big mistake. When, when people, when they came up with that till death to us part shit, people only lived 20 years. They had an easy road to hoe. Now we got to look at that same sucker for 60 years and nobody can hack it. You're looking grim. You don't, you're hoping it lasts. <laughs> you're thinking I'm a cynic, huh? I'm not. I'm a realist. You, you, we know, all know that over 50% of marriages end up in divorce, so how long can I be? I think I'm done. Yeah, John, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Give him a nice big round of applause. <laughs> Go to his table, buy some original scripts of Night of the Living Dead, and he's got books and prints, and yeah. Thanks again, John. Thanks for coming to the show. This is Kari Walgren, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like and subscribe. Plus, remember to have fun and follow your fandom.